Hey guys, Amy with you as always because this is my personal vlog channel. And today we're actually going to be doing something just a little bit different. Instead of a vlog about something about my life, we're actually going to do a bit of a deep dive or a deeper dive into some space history because you guys did not like that I don't like the space shuttle. And really attacked me hard for it. And I'm not going to defend my opinion because it's my opinion and I feel no need to defend it. Instead, I'm going to take this as a really great opportunity to teach you guys something that some of you may know from history and some of you may not, which is the dinosaur. So yeah, my last video, it's going to pop up in one of these corners right here, right now. I'm not sure which one it comes out in. Um, my last video was about why I personally don't like the shuttle enough to cover it on my main channel, Vintage Space. And it was about what Vintage Space really means for me, what kind of encom is encompassed in that title, and why the most common question I get when the space shuttle will be considered vintage enough for Vintage Space, it's not going to necessarily fall under Vintage Space because it's, you know, my own blog and my own YouTube channel. You guys got really mad at me, and I'm not going to address the intense, horrible comments that I got, but there was an overwhelming number of comments that told me um, in no fewer words that I'm a complete moron because I don't understand that the shuttle did some really amazing technological things and that it was the first vehicle to return from space like an airplane, that it was piloted, that it landed on a runway, that it was reusable. And... Here's where the historian in me comes in and just says, yeah, I know all those things, but the shuttle didn't invent those. And the teacher in me wants to tell you guys about all of the pre-shuttle reusable piloted space plane programs that actually not only predicted the shuttle, but helped create the shuttle that we had. So I've given this talk. I'm going to do a bit of a, uh, a kind of extemporaneous chatty version of a talk that I usually give right now. So settle in. This is going to be a little bit of a longer one and a little bit more educational than most of the things on this channel. Um, because I, I've said this before and I've made no secret of my love for dinosaur, which is not dinosaur like a T-Rex. Um, it is short for dynamic soaring, which is the landing profile that this vehicle flew. And I have made the statement in this talk when I give it, and I've given it at this point in three countries, um, that dinosaur is the shuttle America didn't know it needed before it got the one that nobody really wanted. So yeah, I'm going to walk you through in brief the story of Dinosaur. I could do the whole thing, but then we would have like a feature length documentary series on our hands and I don't have time to edit that. Um, so instead, we're going to go through the Coles notes. We're going to go through the basics. And the point is to show you guys that hypersonic research for gliders and piloted flight from orbit and all of the things that the shuttle gave us actually existed at least in potentia and in research programs before the shuttle. So before you say that the shuttle did things that we could never have had otherwise, these things did exist in other forms beforehand, and we would have had them through other means. So me saying that the shuttle isn't necessarily the best spacecraft of all time doesn't mean it doesn't have technical merit. It also means that there's other things out there that I think could have been better, namely dinosaur. All right, so let's just jump on it. So I always start this talk. I'm going to give some stats right off the bat just uh, to kind of ground us in where sort of Dinosaur is versus uh, the shuttle. You can look at the two of them side by side and see that Dinosaur in its launch configuration, as shown in this, uh, this artwork, is extremely shuttleoid. And that was what jumped out to me the first time I ever saw this when I was a teenager. Let's look at the shuttle. Let's start with the shuttle. The shuttle program was approved in 1972, and it promised massive things for NASA in the post-Apollo era. Um, it was meant to be, and it was designed to be, a reusable, low-cost space transportation system, hence the STS designation, with each orbiter, NASA wanted five, um, able to perform 100 flights. It was designed to launch like a rocket, operate like a spacecraft, and land like an airplane. It was designed also to launch interplanetary missions, recover and refurbish satellites in orbit, and the glider was designed to be refurbished and made ready for another launch with a turnaround time of just weeks. It was meant to support, or the program on the whole, was meant to support three simultaneous flights, two up to two in orbit and one either getting ready on the launch pad to go up or just returning and being serviced for the next flight. And ideally, the initial proposal said that the shuttle would be able to fly up to 50 flights per year. 
So the reality of the shuttle program is quite different than the kind of dream scenario as it was originally pitched when it was approved and started kind of really gaining traction in 1972. It was active between 1981 and 2011, and each launch cost somewhere in the range of about $450 million. So that actually puts it on par with the Saturn V launch, so the cost saving was not really there. It did indeed launch like a rocket, operate like a spacecraft, and land like an airplane, but it didn't do as much during those missions as it was hoped to. In my last video, I think I said that it launched five interplanetary missions. I got my figures mixed up. It recovered five satellites and launched three interplanetary missions. That was the uh, Magellan mission to Venus in 1989, the Galileo mission to Jupiter in 1989, and uh, the European Space Agency's Ulysses mission to the Sun in 1990. The average turnaround time between missions, because remember, even if the orbiter is a different orbiter, the launch facility has to be refreshed in time to launch another one. Um, if you look at the average time between flights, it varies between a number of weeks to a number of months. And that's taking into account the average for the years-long delay following the Challenger and Columbia accidents. There were never simultaneous flights of the shuttle, so that goal never happened. And it averaged, again, averaged, some years were better than others, an average of four flights a year. So now let's compare shuttle and dinosaur. And of course, dinosaur didn't fare any better than shuttle because it never actually flew. But still, I think it's useful to have a sense of where those sort of key points line up before we get into the full story. So dinosaur was active between 1954 and 1963. Some people would put the starting point at 57, but I'm going to make a case that it starts a little bit earlier. There was only ever one mock-up made. There were seven very frustrated astronauts attached to the program, one very annoyed U.S. Air Force, a rather frustrated National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Uh, so yeah, pretty much annoying all around. But I think that it could have actually done a lot of good had it been funded through at least one of the many channels it was meant to go through at the time that it did, as opposed to sort of being this weird footnote that space historians know about, but the general population does not. All right, so we can start Dinosaur's story in a number of places, depending on how far back into history you want to go. I usually start with Eugen Sanger, and apologies up front for my inability to really pronounce German names. So Sanger, like so many uh, rocket enthusiasts growing up in Germany in the 1920s and 1930s, um, read the works of Hermann Oberth, namely his thesis, uh, Die Rakete zu den Planten Haumen, which is published in 1923. After reading Aubert's work, Sanger, like a number of his other peers, including Werner von Braun, actually was so inspired that he self-specialized his degree in physics to study rocketry, which was not easy because rocketry was actually not um, considered something that would qualify for the classical requirements for a physics degree. So actually, Sanger, like Oberth, had his thesis rejected because it was not classical physics enough, um, which is hard to imagine now. But uh, Sanger, like Oberth before him, was not discouraged, and he continued to study rocketry and try to come up with ways to make spaceflight happen. His system focused on a 90-foot long vehicle with a 50-foot wingspan. It was cylindrical and tapered to a point on the end with small flat wings, and the key is a flat underside. Now, the flat underside would allow the vehicle to skip off the upper layers of the atmosphere the same way a stone skips off a calm pond. His launch system involved a kind of first stage pusher vehicle that would be on an inclined sled. So the first stage rockets would fire, get the vehicle going, give it momentum, and then the glider's own rocket engines would be able to kick in. And between the two, the, uh, the combined velocity of the two stages would get the vehicle up to that point where it could start that skipping gliding profile, um, traveling all over the planet or at least halfway around the planet by his calculations without actually expending any more energy because it would just be skipping and gliding, skipping and gliding until it landed on a runway. So he thought for sure that this first iteration of his vehicle could be built with existing technology. The only missing piece was the propulsion system. And he didn't really have the means to develop a propulsion system. So what do you do when you have a crazy idea and you need money for it? You go to the military because the military always has the money. So when he took it to the military, he had to militarize it. And by militarize it, he just added bombs. So this became the skip glide vehicle, became the antipodal bomber. And the idea being that from a launch point, it could bomb any point on the planet, as far as the opposite end of the planet, antipode, uh, within an hour of launch and then either return to its base or return to another landing site to be refurbished quickly, turned around, added new bombs, and then launch again. 
1933, Sanger took this vehicle to the Austrian Nazi party to try to entice them with it, and ultimately they said no. It hinged on this very poorly understood chemical reaction of pr liquid propulsion, and they didn't want to have, you know, a project involving potentially killing a lot of people on their hands, so they turned him down. The next year, 1934, he took it to the German military, uh, the, the German army, and they said, no, you're not German-born. Also, we kind of have this guy who is German-born and, like, really good with rockets working for us. Spoiler alert, Werner von Braun. So he instead uh, took it to the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, and the Luftwaffe had no problem with him not being German-born and gave him a decent amount of funding and built him a lab, and they kind of wanted Sanger to be for the Air Force what von Braun was for the army. So these these two uh, arm, uh, military branches would have like dueling rocket geniuses. That was kind of the idea. Skipping ahead and spoiler alert, Warner von Braun um, was one of the leaders of the team that developed the aggregate series of rockets that are better known by the PR name of the Felgeltungswaffe. The aggregate series of rockets was just this kind of sequential uh, building rockets that were more and more capable, had guidance systems, were able to travel further. The A-4 is the one that, that really did the damage. The A-4 was the V-2. Meanwhile, while Van Brown is developing the aggregate rockets, Sanger is languishing in his lab. His lab is shut down in 1942, citing fuel shortages, but really it's just because he was not delivering enough and they didn't want to keep funding his lab. Um, so at the end of the war, Sanger's system has done nothing and Van Brown's system is doing really, really well. So Van Brown, like Sanger, had developed a winged version of his system. So the A-9 was actually a later version of the V-2 that was a two-stage rocket. The second stage, the upper stage, actually had wings, and it would basically do the same thing that Sanger's system would do, the difference being the way it would launch. So Sanger was launching off a sled on an angle, Van Brown was launching on a rocket. Van Brown's system, they would both go up, hit their apex, and then skip and glide off the atmosphere to land at a different point on the planet, potentially bombing someone in the meantime. Now, Sanger tried really hard to get his system in hands that would fund it at the end of the war. Um, he wrote a report called A Rocket Drive for Long Range Bombers and um, circulated it around, but nobody in Germany had any money to sink into a program like this. Uh, Stalin was super into it because it meant he could bomb the United States without having to deploy his men across the world. But he never found Sanger lucky for America. <laughs> um, but Dornberger... Stormberger, Von Braun's boss, also had a copy of this report. So let's fast forward again in the interest of time. So 1947, Dornberger is tried for war crimes because nobody can find enough Nazis to try for war crimes. He's tried in London. He ends up in a prisoner of war camp in Wales. Um, meanwhile, Von Braun is immigrating into the United States as like intellectual reparations from the war. Uh, Dornberger eventually is released from prisoner of war camp and moves to the United States in 1950. He begins working with the U.S. Army and ultimately ends up working for Bell Aircraft. Bell may be familiar to you guys because Bell was the company that built the X-1, the X-1 being the plane that broke the sound barrier piloted by Chuck Yeager in 1947. For Dornberger, finding work at Bell was kind of awesome sauce because Dornberger was, at this point, had been on the losing side of two world wars, but he'd given his life to developing ballistic weapons for the German army. Now, he was in a country that was a victor of wars, that was open to using German knowledge, and was finally working for a company that wasn't designing weapons. They were developing research planes. So in 1952, he rehashed this idea of Sanger's antipodal bomber with Bell's chief engineer, Bob Woods. And Bob Woods was a bit of a visionary in his time. He was the one that really spearheaded the X-1 program, and he was very interested in the skip glide vehicle, Dornberger's idea, this kind of Sanger-inspired boost glide or skip glide vehicle. But Bell did not build the X-1 alone. It was a contractor that built it for the U.S. Air Force, of which Jaeger was a pilot, um, but it was built in cooperation with or with help, rather, from the NACA, which is the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which is simple to think of it as NASA's predecessor organization. So in 1952, Woods, coming off the success of the X-1 with Dornberger and this really interesting idea of a skip-glide vehicle in hand, 
pitches the NACA on a new hypersonic research program with vehicles that could fly beyond Mach 5. And the idea is to really start building on this idea that Dornberger has. Now, Dornberger wants to take this thing way further. He wants to look into a hypersonic vehicle that can fly close to Mach 20, like 20 times the speed of sound. He wants to use this as a test bed for understanding issues of aerodynamic heating and friction from the atmosphere during reentry, but it could reach peak heights of over 350 miles above the planet. So that is effectively returning from low Earth orbit. So the idea of this hypersonic research program, pitched in 52, really starts to gain traction in 1954. Um, but you can't really go from Mach 1, you know, Mach 2 at this point in specially designed aircraft to a hypersonic glider capable of re-entering the Earth's atmosphere at Mach 20. Like, that's a huge leap um, technologically to make in one fell swoop with one program. So the first step was to start really understanding supersonic flight, and that begat the X-15. Now, the X-15, if you are ever near the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in Washington, I highly recommend going to see the X-15 because it is an unbelievably sexy aircraft. It is basically a missile with a cockpit up front. This thing was just fuel tank, just fuel tank with a little cockpit. It's amazing. So the X-15 was designed to start really understanding the challenges of hypersonic flight, of returning from low Earth orbit, not only from the technical side of thing, but from the human factor side of thing. Would pilots be able to manually fly a vehicle down from low Earth orbit? Um, would the heating profiles do weird things to the plane they wouldn't be able to control? Would, you know, you're not just flying supersonically, you're flying through supersonic and then transonic and then subsonic. How would that be for a pilot to manually control? The X-15 was designed to answer all of these questions, or at least start answering the questions. The later version, Dornberger's ultimate version of the Mach 20 glider, would kind of round out this program. Without getting into a whole thing on the X-15, because I have loads of other videos about the X-15 for you guys to watch if you are interested, it was launched from underneath the wing of a B-52 bomber, and it could either fly speed runs, which would be lower uh, lower altitudes runs, just super gunning for speed. The top speed of the X-15 was Mach 6.7, so fast. Um, or the X-15 could actually fly altitude runs, so it would go up on a high trajectory, hit a peak, and then return. In both cases, landing on skids on the dry lake bed at Edwards Air Force Base. The top run of the X-15 was upwards of 300,000 feet feet. That is a lot of feet. So it was really the first step to understanding the challenges of hypersonic flight. Now, as the X-15 program starts really unrolling and starts showing some really good research, the Air Force starts getting in on this whole idea of hypersonics and maybe hypersonics involving weapons because, you know, bombs. It, we were still in, you know, the early stages of the Cold War at this point. So the Air Force starts looking into different versions of this hypersonic weapon and comes up with one called BOMI, it stands for Bomber Missile. There's one called Brass Bell that is a d dedicated reconnaissance vehicle, one called Robo, which is a rocket bomber. And this was ultimately the version investigated by Douglas Aircraft, Convair, and North American Aviation in the uh, late, mid-1950s. And as it became a program with contractors involved getting in on the research, the project was given the name Project HIWARDS, which is an acronym for Hypersonic Weapon and Research and Development System. Now, this surfaced as a full, fully-fledged program in 1956, so also known as Weapon System 464L, which is so not sexy. So the name was eventually given to it of Dinosaur, which is, again, for dynamic soaring, as in its landing profile. By the fall of 1957, Dinosaur was on the table as a primarily U.S. Air Force program with research help from the NACA because NACA was in the business of developing the most beautiful functional aircraft um, and also with a little bit of U.S. Navy thrown in for good measure. And it was a three-stage program. Uh, the first phase would test the space plane and kind of figure out the details of it. It would be the first to fly beyond the limits of the X-15 with a pilot. And like the X-15, it would be air launched from mothership. Phase two would be the reconnaissance weapon system, sort of the brass bell version, um, that would actually have its own rocket engine on board and start reaching peak altitudes. The Dinosaur 3 was the robo or rocket bomber concept, and this would be a reconnaissance weapon system that could also be a multi-stage glider aircraft that could circumnavigate the globe. 
So in the fall of 1957, Dinosaur is on the books as a piloted very high altitude weapon system for lack of a like really strong defining term for what this is going to be. And then on October 4th, uh, the Soviet Union launches Sputnik and kind of throws all of the pre-space, early space, air space space things in the United States into absolute chaos. Um, and that included dinosaur. So two weeks after Sputnik, the NACA and the US Air Force actually had a meeting about what was going to be the next round of hypersonic research. So we'll, the X-1 is round one, the X-15 is round two. What is round three going to be? What is the next phase of understanding hypersonics and tending towards space flight now going to look like? And dinosaur is suddenly like the best option. There's been a lot of research from contractors into what the vehicle will be. There's a lot of research from the X-15 that can apply to the dinosaur. So suddenly it's starting to look like a really good option for the next program. However, when NASA comes into existence and kind of takes over from the NACA, the NACA was in the business of aerodynamics and really understanding flight. NASA is in the business of civilian spaceflight. But unofficially, its goal is to get a man in space before the Soviet Union gets one of their guys in space. And for NASA's purposes now, faster is better than maybe the right program. And the faster is the ballistic Mercury capsule. This is a vehicle that can go into orbit with automation and can fall out of the sky and land in the ocean and just simplify the entire goal of getting a man in space. So NASA's pursuing ballistic spacecraft with Mercury, but Dinosaur is still a NASA program and a joint U.S. Air Force program, and it's still getting enough love. So in 59, uh, Dinosaur on the books, but it gets it gets a number of revisions that actually, I mean, any technology going through revisions doesn't exactly necessarily help it. Um, so in February of 1959, the bombardment goal or the weapons goal of Dinosaur was made the top priority. In April, it was shifted such that the suborbital hypersonic flight goal was the priority and the weapons was second. And then in May, it was flipped back and the military goal was made uh, the, the primary goal again. Continually giving this program a new goal is leaving it really hard for the people who are designing it to design the vehicle. But nevertheless, it's kind of settled with the military goal on top, and in 1959, Boeing is contracted to actually build the glider, and the Martin Company is contracted to build the rocket that will launch it. And at this point, in the end of 1959, another phase is added to the dinosaur program called Phase Alpha, which is designed to determine the applicability of dinosaur to manned orbital flight. So NASA is, in effect, pursuing these two spaceflight programs, albeit n dinosaur never had the priority of Mercury. It is looking ahead at maybe using this type of vehicle for manned spaceflight. So things are looking pretty good in 1960. Um, the U.S. Air Force completes phase alpha in March and determines that the glider's very low lift-to-drag ratio means it is ideal for spaceflight. And Dinosaur is cleared to go forward towards suborbital test flights. And the Department of Defense formally jumps in on the program, endorsing Dinosaur and funding it with enough money to actually see it through stages two and three, so that is advanced orbital operations. And Martin picks a launch vehicle for it. The Titan II um, and potentially the Titan III will be the vehicle. So everything is starting to come together. And the Air Force wants to actually kick up its schedule to get dinosaur flying as fast as possible. Now, Mercury was never going to be the end of ballistic spacecraft for NASA. Already in 1960, towards the end of 1960, it was looking forward at an evolved version called Mercury Mark II, which eventually became the Gemini program. So it's unlikely, I would say, that, that NASA would have gone from Mercury you know, say America had gotten the first man in space before the Soviets did, abandoned it, and then gone with Dinosaur. But still, it was pursuing Dinosaur concurrently with Mercury and Mercury Mark II slash Gemini in the end of 1960. So things were looking good for NASA from the American perspective until the Soviets launched Yuri Gagarin on April 12th of 61, nailing the goal of the first man in space. And NASA had nothing to compete with that. Um, Al Shepard launched on May 5th on a suborbital flight. So even NASA's best attempts or best technologies at the time couldn't match the Soviets. This, of course, is ultimately what led to the moon as a goal, and that is a whole separate thing that I'm not getting into right now. Suffice it to say that the same month that Gagarin went into orbit, the Department of Defense announced a firmer commitment to Dinosaur to the tune of $100 million, which is about 
close to $800 million adjusted for inflation just for the fiscal year of 1962 for Dinosaur. So this is still looking like it's going to be a program that will eventually take Americans into space. So the problem was, as 1961 wore on, the Air Force started to not like its own program. Um, it was still on the books as being a spaceflight program, but also a weapon system, so it was a little bit schizophrenic. But even still, the Air Force was getting pilots involved, and one of the dinosaur pilots, or the astronauts rather, was Neil Armstrong before he joined NASA. So there were pilots training to fly in space on dinosaur, and even NASA was lending its astronauts to the Air Force to start figuring out the cockpit layout for dinosaur. Mercury astronauts uh, Wally Schirra and Gus Grissom both helped design the cockpit layout for dinosaur and started working on training. And this vehicle was really starting to come to life. This was getting, you know, the mock-up couldn't fly in space, but the technical details were all really getting worked out in anticipation of it flying in space. But again, it just couldn't really find its firm footing, and 1962 kind of was like the start of the death knell for dinosaur. In the first half of the year, the Air Force canceled developments towards Stage 3, which was the multi-orbital flights, and then Boeing canceled all suborbital flights because it didn't think they were necessary. And then the Air Force canceled its military application. So now it doesn't really have a thing to do anymore. So Department of Defense Secretary Robert McNamara said that Dinosaur would be an, an orbital research program vehicle. And that gave it its other name. It was designated the X-20. Nevertheless, Dinosaur went on. It was unveiled. That mock-up was unveiled at a press conference in Vegas in September of 1962. And the Department of Defense announced that it was going to be funding, again, adjusted for inflation, about $800 million per year for 63 and 64 to get it flying. By the end of 1962 and into 1963, Dinosaur kind of lost its edge over NASA's own other programs, being Mercury, Gemini, and the still under development Apollo. There was no way Dinosaur was going to come out and like sweep the rug out from under Apollo. It was capsules all the way. NASA was committed to capsules. It tried to use other runway landing systems for Gemini and even looked into them for Apollo with uh, hang gliders, uh, the Regalo wing, and uh, rotor re-entry systems, all kinds of neat stuff that just never came to fruition. It was going to be splashdowns. It was going to be ballistic capsules. Dinosaur wasn't going to change NASA's path to the moon because by this point, the nation was committed to the moon landing goal. And also, Dinosaur was supposed to be answering questions about hypersonic reentry and heating profiles and materials and all these things and human factors, and NASA was also already doing a lot of that. Dinosaur was supposed to answer questions about how humans would survive in space on orbital missions. NASA was doing that with Mercury and with Gemini. Ultimately, Robert McNamara decided that Dinosaur was a poor return on investment. At this point, it had cost from its official sort of endorsement in 57 to mid to late 1963. As adjusted for inflation, it had cost almost $3 billion. And it didn't have a firm mission because NASA was doing space. The X-15 was doing piloted super high altitude, very fast flight. There was no need for Dinosaur, and it was canceled on December 10th of 1963. But the problem was, and it's so easy to see this in hindsight, that NASA really did want Dinosaur at the time. Like, Dinosaur was kind of the vehicle of its dreams, with the exception of the fact that it was not equipped to do things like go to the moon. But ultimately, NASA was so annoyed to splashdown landings. I've done videos about that. Um, it wanted to get away from splashdown landings, and Dinosaur was able to land on runways or on dry lake beds, just like the X-15 was. It would have been far better for the astronauts. Dinosaur was designed to be reusable. It was designed to do so many things that NASA wanted, capabilities that NASA wanted, but it ended up locked into this capsule idea, this capsule shape for the Apollo program. And Apollo just took over absolutely everything that happened in the 1960s because going to the moon to beat the Soviet Union was just the goal and nothing was going to preempt that goal. The other thing that Dinosaur could have given us had it been funded and had it actually flown is these, these futures that I think a lot of us would like now. And there are futures that people like Dornberger and Von Braun and Sanger were all thinking about in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Things like Von Braun's idea of going to Mars. So he wanted to use dinosaur-like small space shuttles, which he refers to in, at some point as space taxis, to take 
pieces of a space station up into orbit to build the station. It would be 900 launches just constantly cycling these tiny little space planes up and down between the Earth and, and low Earth orbit. But that space station would then be able to launch a flotilla of spacecraft to Mars and to the moon and to other planets. And from there, that space station would be our jumping off point for deep space exploration. The commercial and kind of public spinoff that Dornberger wanted was what he called ultraplanes. So this would be a dinosaur-like glider piggybacked on top of a larger glider that would be the booster to have basically a two-stage rocket-powered commercial aviation system. So it would work effectively like Sanger's system meets the Von Braun's A9 system from the late World War II, where um, the two vehicles, the, the booster would launch at a certain altitude, the glider would, it would tip, the glider would launch off its back, fire its own engines, and then skip and glide to its destination. I mean, with Dornberger's system, imagine if you could fly from the U.S. to Australia. The longest single leg flight I think I've done is L.A. to Brisbane. It was 14 hours. With Dornberger's system, he imagined being able to do it in three. That's, that's the future that he wanted from developing this technology in the 1950s. So when it came time to developing the space shuttle, NASA didn't just like look at ideas of what to do and decide to completely invent a new spacecraft out of something that it had never played with. Dinosaur was a NASA program. Dinosaur, in a lot of ways, was just a smaller scale version of the shuttle. Now, what's interesting in NASA's history also is that the idea of wanting reusable flight was never new. I mean, everybody always wanted reusability. That The cost saving of reusing a vehicle for space flight has never been lost on anybody. The problem was that with the Apollo era technology, it was just so much simpler and faster to just make a whole whack of them and launch them. Again, speed was key for Apollo, not necessarily a lasting architecture of spaceflight. That's another story. Um, in, in the mid-1960s, NASA started looking ahead and started bringing up this idea of the shuttle. And it was constantly looking back in the memos and sort of some of the early chronologies that I've been looking through lately, did look back at Dinosaur as one of the technologies that inspired the type of vehicle that NASA would eventually pursue. And actually, some of the earliest shuttle configurations, NASA was looking at three different ones, a Class 1, Class 2, and Class 3. And the Class 1 vehicle, the shuttle that we had got, was actually described in various memos and in various reports as an uprated modern version of dinosaur. So I said this in the video. I've said this before, and I said this in the video that everyone hated, <laughs> that um, one of the reasons I love the Apollo era and focus on that so much for vintage space is because everything modern has those ties back to that vintage technology, that first time you had to solve those problems. And for the shuttle, one of the most interesting things for me, beyond the fascinating politics that led to its existence as it was, is where the roots really came from. And the roots come in these 1930s futuristic space plane ideas that never got off the ground. And these 1950s Air Force programs that were developed but ultimately never flew, but started answering those questions. So the point of this very long video that is way more educational than anything I ever thought would go on this channel, because this is supposed to be my fun space, um, is to say that you can't take the shuttle out of historical context. Because to take it out of historical context is to ignore everything that fed into it, and is to give it a lot, to ascribe a lot to it that it doesn't necessarily have. To say that it's the only thing that ever solved problems of piloted reentry from orbit is absolutely not true because the X-15 started working on that 30 years earlier. To say that it was the first vehicle that ever started looking at how to deal with the heat of reentry for a space plane, the X-15 and Dinosaur looked into that. Dinosaur looked into exactly the flight configuration. Early shuttle flight configurations looked exactly like Dinosaur, even when it was giant. There were all kinds of ways NASA was looking at the shuttle, and they were all influenced by what had come earlier and what it had learned in the interim. There is so much more to any technology than necessarily meets the eye. You might look at the shuttle and you might see that it is the only vehicle that looks like this, therefore it is the only thing that did this. Well, it's not. Because if you look into its history, you find that its history has roots. And those roots inspired the vehicle that it came. And it will inspire things that come after it. But to say that it's the only thing that ever did it, therefore it's the best, is to ignore the fact that it's coming from something. And that something is really meaningful. So you cannot love the thing 
but still be fascinated by its roots. History is awesome, you guys. History in the case like this is big and complicated and messy and tells us so much more about the thing that we think we know all about. Because even if you know what the shuttle looks like, you can pick it out, you know a handful of missions and you think it's the greatest, to know where it comes from should make you appreciate it that much more or should put it in a different perspective. All right, that was a lot of talking. Okay, all that being said, I'm shamelessly self-promoting because it's my channel and I can do what I want to. If you would like to know more about the story of dinosaur, its roots, the roots of uh, Nazi systems, weapons, uh, rockets on American rocketry, space planes, all that stuff, the early things, the X-15, the X-1, it's all in my book up to 1958, up to the creation of NASA. Uh, hi, Pete. Pete's here. Uh, Breaking the Chains of Gravity. You can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it in bookstores. You can buy signed copies off my website. Um, there's a lot more to the dinosaur story in here. It's not all there, but all the pre-NASA version is in here. So let me know in the comments. I'm curious. Um, how many of you have actually come across dinosaur before? Um, and those of you who haven't and who actually were curious enough to learn about the history of the space shuttle that you love. Let me know if this changed your perspective at all. Let me know your thoughts and let me know if you have other space questions. Um, and, you know, anything else. Anything else you feel like saying, just say it in the comments below because this is just the, the weirdo channel for all the space things and space adjacent things and, and cat bums. <laughs> all right. So if you want more from me, more straight up space history, be sure to check out Adventure Space, my main channel, my little internet baby. Um, it's short weekly videos about space history. And of course, follow me on Twitter and on Instagram for daily content that's sometimes spacey, sometimes completely unrelated to space. And of course, subscribe to this channel right here. This is my vlog channel where I will apparently put up the occasional long form video about space, but also all kinds of other things about other facets of my life. Because the whole point is to show you guys that space nerds are not one dimensional nerds. Also, this is the home for the Punk Rocker Moon Stomper podcast, my currently bi-weekly uh, podcast about punk, ska, space, beer, and pets that I co-host with Jason McClellan. This is the weird grab bag of stuff channel, so be sure to subscribe and join in for all the weird fun.